Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This current video is an introduction to my Survey of British Literature course. In the course, I pay a special attention to the evolving socio-historical context in which the canonical literary texts of British literature were produced. And it is to those socio-historical contexts that I turn in this introduction. Let me begin by saying some things about the periodization of Western cultural history. And in the first slide, I'll be talking about economic conditions pertaining to each of those epochs and how those economic conditions relate to the experience of being human, the experience of the individual in relation to family and society, family and community in each of those periods. In medieval Europe then, politically and economically, the societies are organized according to a very hierarchical, top-down status order. And most of the people don't live so well. Most of the people are peasants. It's a triangle model of a social structure with a very few very rich and powerful aristocrats at the top and a large mass of peasants just barely living at the bottom. The modern period is characterized by the emergence of capitalism, first mercantile capitalism, the expansion of international trade in more than simply luxury goods, and the growth of towns and cities, economies that will lead to the emergence of a large middle class. And eventually, the emergence of the nation state and republican and democratic forms of government. And when I say republican and democratic forms of government, I'm using those terms with a small d and a small r, not referring to our particular uh, political parties in the United States, but the idea of popular representation, the idea that leaders are chosen by merit in some way, and that societies are governed by constitutions or consensual agreements in which it's assumed that the government is by consent and not by decree. Also, a dark side of that period, the emergence of colonialism in which the advanced industrial countries usurped and exploited resources from other places that they were able to dominate because of their advanced military power. Well, what does this mean for any individual, for the experience of anyone living in one of these societies? I will assert that it's helpful to link the experience of being human to these organizational structures, economic and political, and I would also include family and church and educational system. All of those things are interlinked and connected in ways that make it a different experience for someone in a feudal medieval society than it is for someone to live in our society. In the medieval society, there is a communal subjectivity, or one doesn't even think of the concept of the individual in the way that we have come to think of the concept of the individual in modernity. Who you are is so much determined by the class you're born in, the land you're born on, your extended family relations, and uh, your place in the hierarchy, that your scope of mobility as an individual is very highly constrained. Modernity, then, is the era of high emphasis on individualism. It's the moment, historically, when people start leaving the farms and going into the towns and cities. In the cities, the individual becomes detached from the familial order and the small community order. You get to the city, you can pretend to be someone more than who you were back home, and people did. Also, with these economic changes, a middle class, a prosperous middle class, began to gain economic power, eventually uh, to clamor for political power. And so during that period, 
in which modernity unfolds more and more, we begin to think of ourselves as individual. This has implications for family relations, for one's religious sensibility and understanding, all sorts of things. In the feudal era, Roman Catholicism in Western Europe was the religion. And it wasn't just that the authority system of Roman Catholicism asserted that it must be adhered to. It was also that in a system like that, it would be difficult to imagine not simply agreeing to what everybody else knew to be true. And there are rare examples of uh, people trying to think outside that box. Some of them were martyred and others were just ignored. Modernity is characterized above all in Western Europe by the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther and uh, John Calvin challenging this dominance of the Catholic Church and saying that the individual should have a direct connection, the individual Christian should have a direct connection to God, to the Creator. Notice how that emphasizes the individual's religious experience as opposed to the subject having a religious experience that is mediated through a church hierarchy. Let me talk a little bit about the conditions of knowledge production. In the medieval period, what is true is simply what God has ordained. Knowledge is assumed to be derived from God. Knowledge is divine. The truth is divine. And the priests of the Catholic Church are the voices or the arbiters of that. But in modernity, with the rise of individualism and the rise of the middle class and the spread of first printing in vernacular languages and soon education more broadly distributed, scientific rationalism becomes the criteria by which truth is judged. And religion loses ground consistently over the centuries to science in determining um, what most people will take as truth and also in determining how the society will organize itself, including in the educational system. At this time in the Middle Ages, what you learned was what had been passed down from the ancient authorities. Aristotle said this, Ptolemy said this about the universe, Plato said this. You began by assuming that they had it right, then you might add something to it. But sometimes they had it quite wrong. Those thinkers all thought that the sun and the planets all went around the earth. Not true, right? Planets go around the sun. When Galileo, with his telescope, after Copernicus and Kepler, determined that the earth was going around the sun and he published it in a book, not in Latin, which only the elites could read, but in Italian, which anyone in Italy who could read could read. It led to his eventual appearance before the Inquisition and his final house arrest because the church said, the Bible says, the sun goes around the earth. Scientific experiment actually observing and recording phenomena and collecting and organizing data are important. And knowledge, scientific knowledge, is built incrementally. You don't always go back to Aristotle or Plato or Galen or Ptolemy. You read the latest research and see what someone has discovered, and you see if there's a refinement to be made, or you try to reproduce the experiment and see if it works for you. Well, that eventually leads to the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment sees human reason as the epitome of human achievement and as really what makes us human. Not as in the medieval period when it was assumed that God gives us a soul and that's what makes us human. More and more, it's that I'm thinking I'm thinking myself into existence or into my subjectivity, and that's what makes us human. Does anyone know uh, Rene Descartes' famous uh, slogan related to this? 
Yes, sir. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Even though Descartes was a serious Catholic, he comes up with this slogan, and this becomes the defining characteristic of what it is to be human in modernity. And of course, we still, lots of us still think we have souls, and we still want to go to heaven, and we think that we are human because God has given us a soul, but we act like, we act like what's really important is that we are thinking and advancing, having progress, and working together to create a better future. Hence, so uh, Michigan Tech's the slogan, create the future. And increasingly, we depend upon quantification and statistics to define who we are. The Human Genome Project. You know, now, a big part of what it is to be human depends on our DNA. It can tell you if you're likely to get cancer, or it can tell you who your real parents are, all sorts of things like that. Changes are thinking about who we are and, and how we can think about it. In postmodernity, the knowledge system is assumed then to be contingent and to have a social material basis. You can't have an idea in a vacuum. So human thought, thought and language has a social and material basis. All knowledge is contextualized in some ways contingent or situated in relation to other possible knowledges and other ways of thinking and possibly may change. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But, as always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email.